I think clients want more advisory work <coughs> in terms of how they should handle their side of the recruitment process. They want more transparency. One of the other wonderful things about the search business mm -hmm. when I started in it was that the whole thing was a dark art. And um, clients had no idea what we did. We didn't have to give any sort of sense of it. If they said, who else have you considered? We were able to say, well, that's highly confidential. We couldn't want to discuss it. Um, now, of course, I think there really is a need to be able to demonstrate to clients that we have scoured the market thoroughly, and there are reasons why we didn't consider people who they might have thought that we ought to be considering. Um, you may be comforted by the fact that there are some things that clients want less of. And I think they probably want less fees. Uh, I think they probably want uh, uh, less of those fees to be retained. Um, so, you know, that's um, slightly uncomfortable thought, isn't it? Um, but on the other hand, I think on the positive side, I think all these mores emphasize the importance of what we do. And what clients want more of is more of what in-house recruiters probably can't properly provide, and it's certainly more of what LinkedIn doesn't satisfactorily provide. And I think that the reason that clients are going to want more of so much of what we ought already be doing is that the clients, most clients are increasingly risk averse. The cost of mistakes is incredibly high, not just in terms of the opportunity cost of not having the right person, fees that may have to be repaid, sort of may have to pay another fee to another firm to put right what's gone wrong, all those sort of things, but actually the damage that a bad appointment can do reputationally. I think this has always been a problem, but with communications so much quicker, uh, so easy for bad news to spread. I think clients are pretty, are pretty nervous of getting it wrong. I think the good news is that what we do is, in my view, every bit as important as it ever was. Some of the demographic changes which Richard Jobs was talking about needed to actually touch on this, but the sort of end of the baby boomers, the proportion of people in the sort of age brackets, I know we're not allowed to be ageist, but in the sort of age brackets which mean that you're likely to have the experience necessary to do certain jobs relative to the population, that is a smaller group and most people have a wider range of job opportunities. So I think that um, the, the, the importance of the service we provide is every bit as great as it always was. But there are many more of us doing it, and there's no question that the competition is much harder than it used to be, uh, much more intense than it used to be. And um, that has some inevitable effects on our business, and they're the same sorts of effects that it's had on every other professional service business. Um, increasingly, the sort of bread and butter work um, is brought in the house. Um, increasingly, the lawyers, the accountants, architects, advertising agencies, management consultants, strategic consultants, everybody has gone global. So increasingly, clients want more global ability. We did a bit of research in our own uh, company and find that um, although 80% of our business is domestic in any particular market, of that 80%, it's sort of too perfect to be true, but it is actually with the way it worked out, 80% of the clients would actually rather use an international firm, even if they know that the search is principally a domestic one. So I think international is incredibly important. Um, how much are we going to be threatened by LinkedIn and this move of recruitment in-house? And I think the, the short answer is that it's, it's up to us. Um, Unless it is clear to clients that we add more value than the alternatives, clients will be sensible and they'll use the alternatives. So, and I, although I gave this rather trite list of more, it's a very simple question, I think, a very simple answer to the question. I think if we're to be successful in future, we've got to demonstrate to clients that we add more value than the alternatives, and we're going to work, have to work ever harder to do it, and fees, except at the very creme de la creme, will be ever harder to... Uh, uh, to charge. Right, somewhere, could you talk about how the profile of the <coughs> consultant and the researcher will evolve in the course of the coming few years as well to meet the, this need for more? Um, the specialism required of, of consultants and their industry knowledge, I mean, fully agree that that, that in-depth knowledge is, is required more and more. Um, as is the ability to collaborate more broadly with you know, colleagues in, with, who bring other industry expertise um, and the objective assessment really around you know, core skills and where, where we can identify transferable skills. So I think that clients, you know, whilst they want us to be incredibly specialist and very focused, the expectation that we will be more creative, look broadly for talent, I think we don't really 
hopefully live up to that enough today, and we need to get better at, at you know, at, at work, either working together or, or assessing um, the skills that, that are transferable from one industry and one world to another. Um, I actually grew up uh, in the industry. Um, I sort of grew up as an, as an associate through the ranks. And in spite of the caliber of people coming into the you know, much higher caliber of people coming into the industry today at the graduate and more junior associate levels, I still think the career path that I've had is, going, is increasingly, well, much harder than it was in my, my day. Um, it's going to take, take people longer, um, not least as we're all sort of you know, pushed up in terms of the level that we work at. They're just not going to have the same transaction experience that we were able to have. I mean, candidly, I sort of grew up with my clients. Um, I think that, and, and I think being a little bit more generous maybe helped too. So I've always been financial services, but I wasn't always as narrow as I am today, and that enabled me to sort of gain a broader understanding of the business. You don't have that luxury today either. Um, so I, I do sometimes think, you know, will, our, will we need to look at, I mean, currently all of our associates have ambitions to become you know, partners of, of the future. Um, I don't think they will all you know, come, come up through the ranks uh, successfully. And as we manage information, or, you know, management of information changes, you know, is there a group of pure researchers who are much more knowledge managers, talent managers, um, and a group of, you know, and then a separate group of people who we bring from industry, um, who've had more business experience, better qualified, an MBA, um, and come in to search effectively as a second career, and we nurture and mentor those through the ranks. Um, so you've sort of got three pools as opposed to the researcher consultant that you have today, potentially. Um, and I think certainly, you know, at Quanferi we're certainly seeing more people transitioning to the business, you know, even, not necessarily it's their third career, but in the third stage of their life, and, and bringing you know, the expertise around the, the industry, the consulting, um, so the, the caliber of individuals going up all the time. Mm -hmm. Our clients clearly um, uh, expect fully international search. This has already come up in, in, in prior panelists and, and now as well, but there are lots of issues around that. Some are around the internal coordination, of our own large or complex firms, or networks for that matter. There are also issues like um, national data considerations that are increasingly rearing their head, which have impacts for, for our industry as well. Um, how do search firms improve their cross-border capabilities over the course of the coming years as well? Okay, so I think the most important thing is this is a client demand. And I think that um, that's the challenge for us, that this is not something that we have been in my view, be careful. And let's be a little bit provocative. We have been putting some excuses, and these data protection laws are excuses. If we worry about it, why e-commerce doesn't? Why Google doesn't? Today, I mean, the information is available to everybody. Our candidates are not just, by their own will, into professional social networks like LinkedIn but they are also accessible in their personal lives in Facebook and some other uh, social networks. So I think uh, we should not be <coughs> putting ourselves excuses not to de really deliver what the clients are looking for. Um, technology is going to enable us to do a much better work, but it's not the solution. I think the problem is not even technology. Technology today is much cheaper, and whoever believes that building a huge uh, new software is going to provide a competitive advantage, I think is wrong. You can get cheap platforms that can deliver precisely the same, and I think that's part of the change that we are going through. I think the biggest issue for search firms is the cultural uh, change. And I think that what we all need to achieve is um, a complete understanding of the client and our business model should be reflecting the client needs rather than reflecting our internal organization. I think this is a challenge because it doesn't matter if you are a network, if you are an integrated firm, or if you are an alliance. We have created these silos that are countries or practices, and then we try to fit everybody into them. And what, what we are seeing is the clients doesn't want to fit there. 
And I can give you examples, and they are really disruptive to the way we have been working before. In the past, most candidates move from one client to another, normally in the same country or in the same industry. So you can follow those clients because normally you have somebody else in the same office or somebody else in the same practice that is close to the client and then that was easy. Today, they move around, they change industries, they change countries, they change even regions. So how we really follow them and how we really keep providing the service? And for me, the answer is trust. I mean, I think this business has always been a combination of a strong brand, and you have been discussing this morning about it, but it's still a personal trust between the consultant and the client. So if you need to follow your client wherever it goes, then the current model doesn't work. Because, I mean, you cannot be restricted to a silo. Our current systems in most companies tells you that if your client moves to another country, you need to introduce to a colleague in that country. That's fine. But honestly, I believe your colleague is going to need to prove himself or herself in front of the client in the same way that any other people in that country, when you have already gained the trust. So I think that's one of the challenges that we need to address, how we change our internal models to reflect this client demand and what is happening in the market. And I think this is a cultural change. And it's logically affecting a lot of people that have built strong reputations, they're very solid consultants, but they don't want to follow their clients somewhere else. They are already, let's say, comfortable where they are. While you have a lot of other people that want to do it, and this creates conflicts in the So I think that's, that's a, a part of the challenge of globalization. Definitely, the second point is teamwork. And I think once you follow the client, you probably are not the best person to serve this client in a new country. So with the trust you have gained, you need to softly introduce your colleagues and work with them to ensure that this client is well served and local knowledge is respected. So I think it is a new way of working that makes things more complicated, but I think the biggest challenge is that we are not culturally prepared to that. Our systems, starting by compensation systems, are normally designed not to help in work and not to help internationalization or globalization, whatever you want to call it. What I really want to focus on here with you, Patrick, is, is what are the, the, real, the real threats to our industry? Is like, and, you know, we all, we've had the conversation around LinkedIn and all the rest, but beyond that, what are, what are the real threats to our industry? So I'm a natural optimist, and um, I actually will echo Richard's words about, I think what we do is, I think, more valued by clients than ever before and I think it's for two reasons. I think they just realize that talent is probably the biggest lever they have to create value and secondly it's actually complex to really evaluate people in a context of, of a given culture and a given company so that's the good news. I'll now put on the doom and gloom uh, glasses and see if I can think about threats to the, uh, threats to the industry and I think there's different <coughs> potential threats and often it's just not embracing them that will be the, the greatest danger. So the first one is, is there a big sort of technology super play out there that's just gonna come and change the world? And it is interesting, if you look at the amount of money uh, that's going into early stage plays in the talent space, it's increasing hugely. And it's not just in what's called series A rounds, which are very sort of speculative, it's later rounds where there is a product, there are revenues. So there's a lot of money going in, inevitably there's a lot of technology coming down the line. However, I think people really struggle to articulate exactly the impact it will have. And I don't think we need to be afraid of it because my guess is even if there is a, a game changer there, the people in this room, we're best placed to embrace it. If you look at the advertising industry, where digital is not just an enablement for them, it's actually a core part of the product. The big advertising agencies are by and large the same. And I think it's something like in the US, 40% of their of, of advertising now is uh, is digital, but it's still the big players that are that are involved. So as long as we embrace technology, I don't think we need to fear it. If you think about maybe the supply demand, I do think that's interesting because you could think about additional players coming in. So you think about in-house, and that's had an effect, but could that dramatically change going forward? Perhaps enabled by technology, so going more up market, you could look at that as either an increase in supply or a decrease in demand. 
I think we are seeing more boutiques come through who are very, very specialized. And then maybe horizontally, you could look at the professional services firms coming in, like you know McKinsey, Deloitte, all of them. It's interesting that our industry actually grew to a degree from management consulting, so we might actually see it come full circle. But if you had all of them just coming and taking 5, 10, 15% of the market away, the competitive pressures that Richard talked about are going to get much, much more intense. And I do think some of those things will, will, will happen. The other way technology might um, play a role is in disintermediation. You just think of fragmenting the, the value chain and, and people just becoming very specialist, so the all things to all men kind of goes out the window. Um, I think we add a ton of value up front in a search by helping a client really think through what their needs are and what the type of person they should be going after. But I think you know McKinsey, Deloitte, the big four have some very smart people that could help with that as well. We are seeing uh, dedicated research companies coming out and just think about if you could, as a client, go to a company and say, I did a take global HR directors. I give you a few bullet points of a spec and you come back within two days with an amazing list of the best people on the planet with at least an initial evaluation. If you had that by specialty around the globe, what would that do? Uh, we do have specialist assessment boutiques out there. We could have specialist referencing people out there that all they do is referencing and over time build up amazing databases. And if you think about that, actually the one bit um, that maybe uh, I haven't talked about is just the approach to candidates. And I still think that's something that Luis mentioned trust. I think that is a really important thing. But um, just in the thought, it always occurred to me that if you look at film stars and footballers, they all have agents working for them. And I just wonder someday will we have CEOs having agents and actually they'll approach them and say, you know, is your, is your, is your CEO interested in X or Y? But if you think about all of that, if any of that comes to pass, you could see a huge fragmentation um, of, uh, of the industry. And again, for people who work across the whole thing, I think you might, you could risk being caught in, in no man's land. And then finally, I think there's always a set of threats to professional services firms that are kind of obvious, but you know, firms disappear. Arthur Anderson is no longer here. Monitor, the firm that Michael Porter founded, no longer here. Dewey LaBeouf is a, a New York law firm, no longer here. CT Partners in our own industry, no longer here. So I think there are just threats to self-inflicted wounds by just a whole variety of, 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 of factors, not industry-wide. Um, so just pure management and good management will play a role. And I would say also the recession is a threat. There will be a recession at some point. You know, some people say in a recession it's when the tide goes out, you see who's been swimming naked and, and I think that puts pressure on organizations. However, I still think most people overestimate threats and I'll just finish Aiden with, there's a, there's a good book written by a guy called Richard Susskind, he's a very smart guy, he's got an OBE, I worked with him at Linklater's a few years ago and the book is called Tomorrow's Lawyers and it talks about the fundamental change, it uses terms like a prophecy of immense and irreversible change in the legal sector. If you read it, I think if you're about to marry a lawyer, you'd rethink. If, if, if law firms were public companies, you'd short them tomorrow. And you'd think, and you'd say, my God, it's going to change fundamentally. The only thing I would say, with respect to Richard, is he wrote a book in 2010 called The End of Lawyers. He wrote one in 2003 called Transforming the Law, and one in 1998 called The Future of Law. And everybody's always predicting fundamental change and technology is going to dramatically change everything. And technology will play a role, but my sense is that it will play a much more gradual role than we think, and actually that we're best placed to exploit it. So there are threats, and we don't know what's around the corner, but at the end of the day, I'd be still bullish about our industry. For those of us that started in this industry in the 90s or 80s or before, of course, when it came to starting out research, etc., that was done by the phone and you, or by, by physical meetings. So in other words, it was very much geared to relationships and to the building of trust that, that you described as. And a frequent issue that, that I see or that I get told of is that when consultants walk into, whether it might be their researcher room, if they sit separately, or, or certainly amongst their researchers, it's, there's a bit more of a slight library feeling 
where there's a lot of work being done with technology tools like LinkedIn or otherwise or their own database and perhaps a little bit less emphasis on the relationship development, relationship management that starts at that junior level with phone work. How do we, A, do you agree with that? And secondly, how might we better promote building, building relationships, relationship management skill sets in our researchers, getting them out of that comfort zone of going first to technology tools? I joined Russell Reynolds 33 years ago. The researchers weren't allowed to make calls. Um, and there was some merit in this. I mean, it's sort of almost making the opposite point to the one you're making. And I think one of the things that has, to some extent, gone wrong in our industry is that consultants rely too much on other people to do what clients think that they're going to be doing. And, and I'm absolutely convinced that at the more senior level, one of the real tricks of the trade is to source at a senior level. And the people who should be sourcing at senior level are senior people in the search firm. And I don't think very senior clients really like being called by teenage scribblers, actually. Um, and I don't think they think that it's what they're paying for, but it's what they quite often get. And the other disadvantage from our point of view, rather than from the point of view of the client, is that if the sourcing call is made by a consultant, they are far more likely to be able to turn that into a relationship that could lead to business than if it's made at a more junior level. So one of the things that I have tried unsuccessfully to do in my own business is to get consultants actually to do more of the work themselves. <laughs> well, um, I actually, when I started, did all the calls um, and have found that actually today, I, you know, there was a period in the middle where I was able to leverage research much more effectively than I do today. And today I'm back to making most of the calls. So, you know, in that, in that respect, I sort of agree with you. Um, I'm told that it's generational, um, and that you know I'm not sure when we were making calls, certainly in research, we were really building relationships. We were doing, you know, we were gathering information, which is now is available. Um, hence the silence, librarian feel of the room, um, and hence why I think you know ultimately these researchers will be more knowledge managers, um, and that the you know the calls I agree need to be made at the senior end. I think um, I totally agree. I think if you're going to approach a senior candidate out there, I think you need to have that done by the consultant. And by the way, one of the real parts of value add that I'm not always sure clients see is that there will be candidates who will only come to the table because of your relationship with them and will sometimes end up taking a role, and I'm sure you've had it before, and they've, they've said, look, I never expected to be here, and I only actually engage because I had the relationship with you, the consultant. And again, that may not be visible to clients, but it's huge value add. So I do think um, those calls need to be made. I still think if you've got really world-class researchers, they can still do an awful lot on the phone, sourcing, talking to people, building relationships at the next level. So I don't think it's an either or. I think it's just working out in any given search, any given situation, who's the right person to make that call and, and just using judgment. Because it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, we're talking about the future of the profession, the idea that we are a profession. We are not an accredited profession. And we are describing particular skill sets and a, and a career track. We're describing communities within our businesses. Yet, how strong are we actually in terms of creating genuine career track? I mean, we have the traditional slight like journeyman model of researcher progressing to consultants. I wonder how good are we really in terms of investing in our younger consultants, our principal levels as they might be called at some firms, into fully fledged partners. Don't we do a poor job there as an industry? I think probably uh, it is easy for me to answer that question because I think highly constructors today probably have one third of our consultants came from the ranks. Um, it means challenge because um, when your new associates suspect that they are going to be promoted at a certain point to a consultant level, they have a level of demand um, and expectations that is sometimes challenging to manage. But on the other side, allow us to try to attract people that is interested in having a career. Um, I, I don't think we're doing a better job. I think that we can do a better job. 
And I think that's, that's something that all of us should be looking at, particularly because some of my colleagues already mentioned, we have a different generation now that do have different expectations and, and it's going to be more challenging how to motivate them and then to keep within the business for years. I, I, I see a biggest challenge. Um, one of our experiences, and I think that's something that uh, um, I guess is going to happen to all of us, is when you grow somebody from an associate rank and become a consultant, and then when he or she is 35, is already successful, some cases has had a management role, is looking at the future and thinking, okay, what am I going to do? Another 30 years doing the same thing in the same company that I started. So I, I don't think the new generation is prepared for that. It's already happening. So I think this is a challenge. But I believe that the future of the business and to become creative, as you mentioned, it is to really helping the people that we hire as researchers, as associates, to grow uh, if they are capable for it. And um, as we many people know, I've been an advocate inside Heidegger and Struggles for some kind of upper out policy similar to what McKinsey or Peter Europe does. It must be difficult to generalize about what the industry does in terms of developing its talent because it will vary enormously from firm to firm and it's far easier for big firms to have programs. We have a what we call the partner development program which we do jointly with the CAS Business School and it's something that we couldn't have done when we only had 25 people in the, in the office but once you've got the resources. So I, I, I'm not sure that there can be a generic answer to the profession. One of the reasons why um, clients might choose one firm rather than another is that it gives them a, you, you're never blamed for buying IBM. Mm -hmm. You know, it gives you a sense of confidence. It it's, perhaps applies to less senior clients. The guy at the top can do what he or she wants, but you know, the uh, clients at a certain level don't want to be um, find themselves in a position where the search firm screwed up and their boss says, well, why on earth did you use that company? So accreditation could give some comfort against that. Well, but your question was, will it happen in our lifetime? Well, I'm probably older than some people here, so probably not. <laughs> um, so I don't think it's a big deal. I think the question as to what would drive it is, is an interesting one. And I think we all have responsibilities to really keep up high standards in the industry. But if you had a short, in a short period of time, a number of incidents where, let's say, somebody's appointed to a CEO role, and it, you see that the right checks weren't done, you have a major off-limit scandal, you find another firm is doing some work and some insider trading was going on or something, you had, and you had other scandals all come together, I think it would be really damaging for the industry. Um, but that might then lead to people to say, what is this industry? It's, it's, you know, it's a really vital one in terms of, of talent, but it doesn't have any accreditation, so we need it. So I think you might have some factors like that that would make a difference. Um, I think if we continue to all operate at very high professional standards, I'm not sure it will come, and I'm not sure it's really that valuable. Yeah. Again, looking ahead, are we looking at the headquarters of the global firms really being based in Asia? I think what, I, what we need to look at is that it doesn't matter where your headquarters are. I think that the, the problem is to build the capabilities to serve your clients, whatever they are, where headquarters are re less relevant. I mean, if you think about, uh, I'm, I'm a consumer person, so I mean, I think Procter & Gamble is in the middle of nowhere as a headquarter, Walmart is somewhere in Texas. I mean, so this is, this is the typical, I think, example that where your headquarters are is irrelevant. I think what is relevant is that you build the capabilities to serve the clients. And capabilities is not only to have an office and people, it's as well to understand their culture, their needs, but they are going to be different. And we are need, we, and our, our obligation will be to serve them, not just in Asia, but in the rest of the world, and respect the culture that they have the same way that we respect the culture of our current clients. I think it does matter where the headquarters are actually, just from a, you know, from a coverage perspective. I mean, at the end of the day, where the headquarters are is where senior management will be, where decisions are taken, where you know, consultants will need to be building relationships um, and understanding, understanding the, the business of their clients. So it, you know, if they are all out in China, it's going to impact you know, how we look at our Chinese 
businesses and, and ensuring that we've got the, the talent on the ground. So, because I do, I still believe that sort of you know, local relationships are, are important in spite of you know, the globalization of the world. We've talked about China before. Um, given that it is frequently a low <coughs> environment, or certainly from a, a a fee perspective relative to some developed markets, it's a more nascent, immature marketplace when it comes to executive search. Yet we've heard about the direction of travel in terms of, of um, demand. How do we bridge that gap as an industry? Take that. Um, I think you can look at other industries, like the big four, management consulting. It's interesting how they have all evolved. Um, and grow, and I think when they started off, um, they had a lot of these teething problems, and fees were lower, and the way you worked with clients were all quite different, but over time that changes. Um, and at the end of the day, when it comes to fees, clients will pay your fees if they think you're worth it. It's as simple as that. And if you can prove to them that, look, this is why you should work with us, and why it's worth paying the fee, and they believe you, they will, they will pay it, but you're right, culturally sometimes it takes a little while before that, that kicks in. Um, so you still have a delta in fees, even at management consulting level between North America, Europe, and Asia Pacific. So we're probably fooling ourselves if we think it's all gonna harmonize very quickly, but I think it will come together just naturally. Yeah. Would Pamela agree with that? Do you think we will harmonize to a common level? Or no, or I don't, I don't know. I, I, um, I started, almost started my search career in, in Hong Kong. Uh, and I've lived in China and I go there, oh, can't be heard, aren't you lucky? Those at the back who couldn't hear. Um, um, so I mean, I've got some nature experience and I think it'll be quite a long time before we see that harmonization. After all, um, the business links between the United States and Europe have been much longer established and, and um, much more extensive uh, for a very long time. And we still see very significant fee differences between the US and, and Europe. So I think there'll continue to be differences. Um, but I don't know how quickly the change will happen, but you know, my guess is that it's going to be quite a long time before we see some of the emerging markets being as significant in proportion to their GDP for search. I mean, France and the UK have almost identical sized economies, but the search industries in those two markets are radically different in terms of size and in terms of the sectors in which search operates. We do arrange you know, some of the sorts of search that are done in the UK for uh, vice chancellors of universities and permanent sectors and things like that. It'd be completely inconceivable that a search firm would be asked to do those sort of searches in France. So even where we've got two countries as close together in size and culture and geography and everything else, uh, one, doesn't see, um, uh, one doesn't see that much convergence in terms of the way the industry operates. So I think it will be a bit different between the US and China for some time. You talked a little bit earlier, Patrick, around um, uh, you know, perhaps what might fuel, let's say, the accreditation debate, i.e. a series of um, perhaps scandals or certainly ethical issues that might impact a corner of our industry but that might affect us all as a, as a, as a profession. Um, there is the other angle, which is increased spotlight, and we've certainly seen this in the country here, political spotlight on the role of search around specific dimensions, most notably here in terms of gender diversity on boards. Um, often we are painted as the, the negative actor, the, 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 the corner that um, inhibits diversity at a point which of course we may recognize as unfair, but it's a useful stick to beat the industry with. Do you see, um, what do you see as, as threats from a, let's, regulatory isn't the right word, but certainly from the broader um, uh, public perception of our industry to how we, how we develop ourselves in the course of the next few years? Um, well, I think you're right. We do, sometimes we're an easy industry to bash um, and, and easy to, to blame. I think people, who were closer, and I'm not saying within the industry, but looking at the diversity debate, I think fully understood that we weren't to blame, but importantly were an enabler, a cog in the wheel to help solve the problem, which we are. Um, so I think as long as we don't put our head in the sand and are willing to engage with all of these debates 
I think we'll be fine. And by the way, I think we have responded really, really well. And I think if you look at some of the the stats and the movements over the last few years, I think uh, I think we've all made improvements. Um, and I think search firms have, have helped with that. So I'm not sure um, that we need to worry too much about public perception, if you like. I, you know, again, people have a perception, but I think when you get down to nitty gritty, there's nothing that would really concern me. At the end of the day, um, it's about what clients think. And I think clients more and more do see the value of, of, of what we deliver. So as long as we, any challenge that's given us, as long as we don't sort of throw our toys out of the pram and say it's not our fault, all of that, as long as we respond, I think, in a mature, professional, engaging way, which I believe we have, I think we'll be fine. I don't see any, any concerns at all. Okay. And share across the group. Would you mind if I raise something you haven't raised? Because well, I do think it's quite important. Lewis is splendidly sanguine about the um, data protection um, issue. I, I'm less sanguine. Um, I think that there is a, a, a very real danger that legislation could make things that we do every day illegal. And I think one of the ways in which the AESC can help all of us most, because this is something that not one of our firms, however big, can fight on its own, but as an industry, I think that there is an opportunity for us to lobby to ensure that the legislation that comes in, particularly in Europe, I suspect in the short term, but it may apply just as much in America, I don't know, less of a problem in the emerging markets, uh, that there isn't legislation which makes our business more difficult. Now, Lewis is quite right. I don't quite understand how Google gets away with some of what it gets away with, but, but you know, maybe we get away with it. But we don't really want to be getting away with what is not legal. And I, I truly believe that it's, it's, this is an area where we should cooperate as an industry. At this point, I'm going to open it up to questions just for a few minutes. Um, any thoughts from the floor? Our, our logo says executive search and leadership. Uh, can you talk a little bit about where leadership consulting fits in um, the future of the, of the profession? You know, if I think about how it's how it's impacting my my search life and, and my clients, um, you know, for for, for me, it's an incredibly sort of powerful tool um, to continue to add value um, in in some ways to sort of you know justify the uh, you know further justify our existence and what we do um, to you know, rely less on my personal judgment and experience, but to bring, you know, tools that allow me to bring sort of object, obj more objectivity, if you like, to the process. Um, you know, from a, from a conferry perspective, it's obviously looking at it from the, from the top and, and the bottom. So I think, you know, from our perspective, clients want more advice around leadership advisory. They don't just want, you know, to, to plug that gap at this particular time. Um, they want help with their succession <coughs> planning. They want advice on you know, how to manage that talent through the process. When I um, bought Odgers 17 years ago, we had 25 people, and people were urging me um, to offer a whole range of alternative services. And I thought that the trick was to stick to the knitting. People knew what search was, and I thought that if we were going to grow from small to a respectable size, we were more likely to do it by making sure that people understood what we did and doing it, rather than trying to do all sorts of things that we didn't know how to do. Uh, now, on the other hand, that we're quite big, certainly in the UK market, um, there comes a point where you end up wondering what the next trick is. And that, if you're a public company as big as Corn Ferry, there is an absolutely compelling economic reason why you need to move into new sectors and new markets. I mean, it may well be very good for the clients, but actually, your shareholders are going to demand it. If you're a private company and you are perfectly content being relatively small, you may or may not want to do it. And I think that's very market specific. Egan Zender's done it very successfully because on the whole, it seems to work very well in Europe. It, on the whole, works rather less well in, most, in the UK and other markets. So I think it's a, it depends on the circumstances of the, of the firm. I don't think there's an absolute to it. About the change of the profession, do you see a longer time for the decision taken by the clients, with the negotiations, when you have a, a candidate, you know, being uh, being selected, then I think our role, advisor as an advisor, is getting 
bigger than uh, never before. I definitely see a longer, longer time frame. I don't think we, I, look, I don't think we measure it terribly well at Convery, but candidly, I think the, the days to complete uh, seems to be getting longer rather than shorter. I think a lot of that is you know, our clients' complex decision making. Um, it isn't all down to us. But when I when I look at our clients' surveys and think, what do they complain about most? It is, you know, it takes too long. Just the process takes too long, so it's a process. You know, they expect a more, you know, continued advanced process, you know, more efficient, effectively. Um, and yet, I think we are you know, often handcuffed by their own decision making. Um, certainly, in financial services, the regulatory environment has made it much more complicated. You know, we're now, you know, sometimes that can add. 60, 90 days to process while we wait for, for somebody to uh, to be signed off by the, by the FCA. Um, so def definitely taking much longer. Yes. Okay. I, I absolutely agree. I mean, in, when I started with no technology, the rule was 30 days to get three qualified candidates in front of the client. Now we have sort of weasel words about 30 working days, which is a completely different thing. Um, uh, and it gets longer and longer. But actually, I quite agree with what Solomara said. Much of the time, and what I, we try and measure two things. One, which is the time between starting the search and introducing the candidate who eventually gets the job, and the time between that candidate being introduced and then being offered the job. And one finds that most of the time is on the client side after they have met the candidate and you know the time between that and um, and them striking a deal so partly for the reasons that you said earlier. I, I think one of the questions and I think this 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 um, I think probably where in my view this this was coming from should we play a more advisory role when I think in terms of I mean in the past we just take a very it's a simple approach. We introduce candidates. We describe how the candidates are, what are their strengths, what their weaknesses. A good job, but normally didn't take any position about it. We we didn't try to advise the client why one or other candidates we think is a better fit for their company. I think today we have clients that start to be under a lot of pressure about making the right decision. And if we still keep ourselves in a very comfortable position, just describing the candidates but not advising about who is the right candidate, I think we may be failing to them, and that can explain why they take so long sometimes to make a decision. I'm going to regret this analogy, but there's a line in Miami Vice 2 where one of the drug dealers says to the guys who are shipping it, look, I don't pay for a service, I pay for a result. And I actually think time to complete and other things are generally irrelevant. I agree completely with Lewis. Our value add is helping them make the right decision. And I think we have to actually add more value there, spend more time there. And just ask yourself this, if half of our fees were at stake that we only got a year after the placement on the condition that the, the client thought it was an outstanding A plus placement, how would we behave? And I think that's a really, really good question. So I think days to complete and other things, they're important to measure. We need to look at things and make sure, and clients do complain about speed, but ultimately, you get them the rock star that moves the dial. They won't care if it's two or three weeks longer. Thank you very much. So definitely greater expectation uh, on our judgment. I would very much like to thank the panel, Patrick, Lewis, Sonmara, and Richard. I mean, this has been very, very interesting. Um, round of applause. <laughs>